For weeks now, I've been traveling around this extraordinary country, from Derry to Derby, from Edinburgh to Peterborough, Woking, Warrington, Wigan, and everywhere I've been, I've been listening to you. And what I've heard again and again is that what people feel they need in this country, what they need in this country is leadership. And people are asking why, at this moment, I wish to take up this poison chalice. I keep hearing again and again. Why on earth would you want to be prime minister at the moment? What a terrible time to be prime minister. But it is exactly now, it is exactly now that we have to make a choice. A choice of two different paths in our country. We stand at a crossroads. On the one hand is a choice of something that I don't want to call populism. I don't want to call it populism because I believe in people, right? The reason I'm here, the reason I listen to you, the reason I talk to you is that I believe in listening to people and talking to people. I believe in people. I hate the fact that this word populism has been taken by the other side. I think the choice is instead a choice on the one hand of fairy story and on the other hand of the energy of prudence of seriousness, of realism, that is going to make this so much a better, so much a happier country. And although I'm going to speak today almost entirely about what I love about this country, almost entirely about the ways in which this country can be so, so much better than it currently is, I'm going to start with that great prancing elephant in the room in this big circus tent. I'm speaking not about the leading leadership contender here. I'm speaking. I'm speaking. No, no, no. I... The great prancing elephant in the tent is, of course, this vision that I don't call populism, but I call negativism, summed up in that phrase, no deal. But it's not just no to a deal. It's no to everything. It's no to Europe, it's no to trade, it's no to parliament, it's no to reality. And we're not a no country. This country's greatness, your greatness, in your individual lives, in your families, in your businesses, and the charities you work in, is founded not on the word no, but on the word yes. And it's a yes that's founded in reality. Because underlying all these stories that the other candidates are putting forward, that masquerade as optimism, is a failure, a failure to grasp reality. What they are telling you is fairy stories. They're giving you exactly what I read every evening to my two-year-old and my four-year-old in bed, if I'm ever released from Parliament in time. And it's always the same story. Right, sometimes the villain is the Gruffalo. At this particular moment, the villain appears to be the elites and the establishment in Europe. But the story is the same. The story is there is some benighted victim. There is some great scapegoat who's responsible for all our ills. And there's some secret, magical path which you're going to be led on through this great prophet who's going to lead you to the uplands. But this prophet is not a real prophet. It is a prophet of negativity. It is a prophet of the no. It is the great word of all the false prophets through the ages. Because in fact, the way that you change the world is being honest to the way the world is, the way that you change your family, the way you change your business, the way we change this country, is to begin by loving this place, loving it in its reality. Loving it in its sense, its deep sense. I'm going to give up on this podium. I can't be bothered with this podium, right? <laughs> Loving it in all its sense of mystery, of difficulty, of diversity, of difference. No one of us in this audience, of course, is remotely the same. Locked in all our brains is millions of different views. And that is the energy of this country. And that energy, that energy of action, begins with an energy of prudence. 
a very unfashionable word, but then I'm a conservative, a very unfashionable thing at the moment, right? <laughs> and I'm a conservative because I believe in prudence. One of the fundamental things that distinguishes my campaign from the other campaigns is I do not believe in promising what we cannot deliver. And I do not believe in pretending that you're going to get some new deal out of Europe before the 31st of October. I don't believe in pretending that there is something called no deal that you're going to be able to drive through Parliament. I don't believe in promising money that we don't have. I don't believe in the 84 billion pounds worth of tax cuts that the other candidates have already offered in this race. Right? I do not believe in pledging 42 billion pounds to a single department. I believe in living within our means. I believe in being honest about the fact that if we are sensible and thoughtful and serious as a country, there will be some more money to spend. And I believe in being honest about the fact that my priorities are education, our infrastructure, our broadband, our productivity, our rail lines in the north, but that we can only spend that money if we have that money, because we live in reality, not in fairy tales. So first, the energy of prudence. Secondly, what is lacking in this debate and in our politics is the energy of shame. We need a sense of shame. We need to feel shame. Our politics must begin from a sense of shame. We must begin by looking at things and saying, this is not good enough. The broken windows in our prisons are not good enough. The piles of garbage in our prisons are not good enough. The drugs flowing into our prisons are not good enough. When I see an 88-year-old woman looking after a doubly incontinent 93-year-old man, it is not good enough. Yeah, yeah. Right? And embedded in that sense of shame is a very simple, very powerful question, which if I am lucky enough to be prime minister, lucky enough to be your prime minister, because I would be your prime minister, not just the Conservative Party's prime minister, not just the members of parliament prime minister, but your prime minister, I would have one simple question put above every desk of every civil servant in this country, which is, would you be proud to put your mother or your brother or yourself in this hospital, in this school, in this prison? Would you be proud to bring someone from another country and say, this is Britain. This is the way that we do things in this country. Do you feel a sense of pride or do you feel a sense of shame? Which brings me to the next energy, which is the energy of seriousness. Seriousness, right? We are a serious country. We should be a serious country. But being serious means being serious about our national security, being serious about our intelligence services, being serious about our National Security Council, being serious about what it means to change the world and being dignified, being dignified in our government, being dignified in our parliament, by reaching out to the world and saying, come, see our chamber, see our debates, sit with me in the National Security Council and challenge every country on earth to match our level of intelligence, our level of integrity, our level of seriousness. The next energy which we need to find is the energy of action. Leadership is about listening. Leadership is about vision. But above all, leadership is about getting things done. Right? Leadership is about doing things. It's about action. It's not good enough. I felt this when I was prisons minister. It's not good enough to sit around a table and debate great abstract questions of prison policy when your prison is filthy. Which is why my philosophy of action, what I loved about working with prison officers, what I loved about working with prison governors, is it isn't about the talk. 
it's about sorting it out. It's not just about my standing up and saying the violence in prisons is unacceptable. 32,000 people a year are being assaulted in our prisons. 10,000 prison officers a year are being assaulted in prisons. But that I am going to sort it out. And sorting it out means exactly that. I'm going to resign if I do not reduce the violence in these prisons. I'm going to set up an ops room. I'm going to put the 10 most challenged prisons up on the wall. I'm going to bring in a brigadier, and we're going to sit down once a week, and we're going to go through them number by number, line by line, until those prisons are sorted out. I'm going to invite, and this is what I did, the prison governors up to my house in Scotland so we could spend two days talking, walking, going through those prisons. I spent a day at Wormwood Scrubs shadowing a prison officer to see from morning through to night exactly what happens when the cell inspection takes place, exactly whether you've checked the call bell, the nightlight, the daylight, the screw, the bolt, the skin. And in the end, if we achieved it, it was not about me. The fact that I didn't need to resign, the fact that we reduced prison violence by 16% over three months was not about me. It was about the prison officers. It was about the governors there in Leeds, in Wormwood Scrubs, in Wheelson, in Humber, in Hull. Dedicated public servants, dedicated public servants who have to be teachers and mentors, psychiatrists who have to cut people down who've tried to hang themselves, who have to put up with abuse day in, day out, and who are still working to change people's lives and protect the public, because in the end, this country is about action. Now, that then comes to my final point about energy. The energy to change this country is also about conviction. Conviction, right? In the end, the problem with a lot of these candidates, I feel, is that it feels as though their policies have been generated either from a think tank or from some kind of focus group. But when I say to you I want this country to be fairer, to be greener, and to be more united, it is because I feel these things. Right? Why do I want it to be fairer? But I want it to be fairer because I had to sit there with an 80-year-old woman who had watched her daughter murdered and raped in front of her and who had then been raped herself by somebody that had been released from one of our prisons. That's why I want this country to be fairer. I want this country to be fairer because of that 88-year-old woman looking after the 93-year-old doubly incontinent man. I want this country to be fairer because of the face I see of a mentally ill, agoraphobic person opening the door to me when I knock on that door and that sense of despair, the sense of a country that has no place for somebody. I want this country to be greener because I love this landscape. I love this country. I began to love this country through the soil. The reason I want to plant 100 million more trees is that I myself have planted 5,000 trees, stuck my hand in the earth, teased out the roots, squeezed it into the soil, tubed it, protected it, staked it. And if I say farmers can work with me to get 100 million more trees in the ground over four months, that's because I know how to plant a tree. And if I say this country should be more united, it is, of course, in part because I sat there in Iraq, as indeed did other people in this room, because I'm very, very lucky here today that I have people in this room who served in the military when I was in Iraq, who served as civilians with me in Iraq, and like me, lived through division, lived through conflicts between tribes, between Sunni and Shia. There are people in this room who served with me in the Balkans, who saw the conflicts between Serbs and Bosnians. But for me, I believe in unity because I'm a Scot. I represent an English border constituency. Were the United Kingdom to break apart, I would, quite literally, have no country. I would have no idea who I was representing. I would have no idea what my identity was. So when I say I want this country to be green, to be fair, to be united, this isn't something that comes from a focus group or from a policy paper. 
it comes from conviction. I've been thinking a little bit recently about my father because it's been the D-Day celebrations. And I went with my father to the Normandy beaches. And my father was a extraordinary man. He's a sort of slightly comical, uh, exaggerated Scottish figure. He swathed himself in tartan. Even in Vietnam, he wore tartan trousers, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a man who uh, organized sword dances in Shanghai and Kuala Lumpur. Right? Uh, this is a man whose passionate love of the United Kingdom seemed to be largely based on the fact that he liked teasing the English and would have been heartbroken if there had been no English to tease. He was also a man uh, deeply, deeply conservative, deeply romantic about his family and his regiment. I remember him flying halfway around the world to see me during my very, very brief period as a young officer on the Black Watch to watch me marching on a Remembrance Day parade in the rain in Market Drayton in Shropshire. I remember him flying again halfway around the world later in my life when I was based with a military unit in the Balkans, trying to offer his help slightly unsuccessfully to help us catch a war criminal. He was then 80 years old. Right? <laughs> That's the kind of man he was. But what I remember most of standing on the Normandy beaches with him was his anger with his commanding officer. And this really surprised me, because he loved the army. He loved his regiment, and yet he was absolutely furious. And I, I'm going to finish with this, because it sums up what I'm trying to talk about, about the choice that we face. The choice that we face between one way of seeing the world and another, between one view of Britain and another, one vision of reality and another. My father had been a battle school instructor. And for those of you old enough to remember that, that meant that he spent a lot of time inspired by General Montgomery going around, throwing whiz bangs at people, making them learn how to fire a maneuver. So fire a maneuver means you hide in the hedgerow. You, you crawl along the ground. You provide covering fire, and you move in small little units. And they arrived on the Normandy beaches after he'd spent two years as a battle school instructor. And his commanding officer, on their first advance against the Germans, announced that they were going to have none of that. Instead, they were going to march line abreast across the field as though they were at Waterloo, straight into the German machine guns. The entire company was killed or wounded before they were a quarter of a way across that field. And I realized from that why it is my father always said that courage was not the opposite of cowardice, but that courage was the golden mean between cowardice and foolhardiness, that courage drew, like all the best politics of Britain, like all the best politics of the Conservative Party, out of an unflinching ability to face reality. Courage is about using the hedgerows. And in the end, if I have one message to you on the choice that we're all going to face as members of parliament, as members of the Conservative Party, and ultimately, if I'm lucky enough, if I'm lucky enough to stand in a general election and get the vote of people in this room who are not members of the Conservative Party, the choice is quite simple. It's a choice between fantasy and reality, between a fairy story and a concrete idea of what it means to embody the dignity of this country. It's a choice of who you want to have as your leader. Our country is embodied in its leaders. Your reputation, your pride, your courage is embodied in your leaders. There was a time when this country was known for King Canute's attitude towards the reality of a rising flood. There was a time when this country was known through King John's attitude to Parliament. There was a time when this country was known from Henry VIII's attitude to family values. <laughs> but there was a time also when this country was known for the dignity and seriousness of Gladstone, when this country was known the height of the Second World War for the astonishing, exuberant genius of Winston Churchill and for the quiet dignity with which Attlee conducted himself in the years after the war. And in your choice, you will be making a choice between one vision of Britain and another. And the vision that I want to bring you with me to achieve is a vision of a leader who listens, 
of a leader who will walk, I promise you, through every county in the United Kingdom, listening and walking, listening and walking day by day and sharing with you the energy that comes, the energy that comes from prudence, the energy that comes from shame, the energy that comes from seriousness, the energy that comes from action, the energy that comes from conviction, the wisdom of practical judgment which provides the only path towards making this a much better and much happier nation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to take a series of questions. So I'm going to start uh, with broadcasters, and then I'm going to go to people in the audience. Yep, OK, very good. We have a broadcaster. Yeah. Nick Hopp, BBC Newsnight. Um, Rory Stewart, um, I've been to most of the Tory leadership launches, and I think it's fair to say that none of your rivals has put on a show quite like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. graduate, you know his name, Boris Johnson, that when Boris Johnson steps up, stands up tomorrow, all of this will be swept aside. Nonsense. Nonsense. I believe, I believe in this country. I believe in the Conservative Party. I believe they are a deeply wise, generous, thoughtful group of people. I do not believe for a moment, and, and this isn't just nonsense, Every association that I go to up and down the country, when you explain that no deal is a recipe for delay, that no deal is a non-existent thing, it's not a destination, it's a failure to reach a destination, and when you ask them, do you really, and I don't want to make this too personal, but do you really feel that this is the person that you want engaging with the detail of the future of your health and education system, is this the person that you want writing the instructions to the nuclear submarines? Is this the man that you want embodying your nation on the world stage and guiding you through the most difficult choice that Britain has faced for 50 years? I trust the Conservative members to arrive at the correct answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, do we have any other hands up? No, 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 no. Yep, there we are, very good. Well done. Uh, Sam Coates, Sky News. Um, thank you for the metaphor. Um, but Mr. Stewart, you are standing to be leader of the Conservative Party. Do you really think that in your biggest of big tents would fit Margaret Thatcher, or Michael Howard, or Ian Duncan Smith, or Jacob Rees-Mogg? And if they don't, do you risk going from greatest showman to conservative clown? Very good. OK. <laughs> so it's, it's, firstly, it's a very elegant question. And secondly, uh, in, in, in the competition uh, for, for who's standing for the title of the greatest clown in this race, there may be some competition. But <laughs> I, 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 but no, I would feel very strongly that Mrs. Thatcher could sit in this tent because I am a conservative. And why am I conservative? Well, as I've explained, I'm the only conservative in this race when it comes to fiscal and economic prudence. I'm the only conservative in this race who actually cares about not making tax cuts we can't afford. I'm the type of conservative like Mrs. Thatcher or Winston Churchill who cared about detail. And I'm the type of conservative that wouldn't go around saying, that we're going to raise employers' national insurance and drop income tax without noticing that employers' national insurance is a United Kingdom phenomenon, and income tax down to Scotland 
so that people in Scotland are going to end up worse off from that tax change, right? I'm the type of conservative, in short, that believes, like Mrs. Thatcher did, that being a conservative believes in small government, in respect for traditions, respect for individual rights, restraint abroad, and prudence at home. And in that, I'm a more of a conservative than anybody else in this race. said very eloquently that you reject negativism, and in particular you said you reject the negativism of a no-deal Brexit. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn today, in partnership with your Tory colleague, Oliver Letwin, has started a parliamentary process which they hope will take a no-deal Brexit formally off the table. Will you support that initiative? Okay. So. Just to fill in everybody in the audience, because I actually slightly missed this myself because I was giving a speech in the House of Commons when this was all happening. A proposal is now being brought forward through legislation to try to take no deal off the table and I believe prorogation off the table, right? Both things. So the first thing is that I am entirely against no deal and I am entirely against prorogation. I haven't read the details of this. My instinct is I would be wholly supportive of a move that tried to do that. Why? Because no deal is not a credible threat. Nobody can get no deal through Parliament because we, including me, will stop no deal going through Parliament. Why will we stop going no deal going through Parliament? Well, look, we keep talking about it in the abstract, and then we get into the questions of project fear. <coughs> Just bring it down to my constituency. Just bring it down to somebody exporting cheddar from my constituency. Under the no deal tariffs, they would be taking cheddar into my constituency at £2,000, and they would be exporting back to Europe at £2,700, and that's the end of them. And it would be also not just the dairy industry, the beef industry, the sheep industry, the car manufacturers, and if anything underlies it all, anything underlies it all, that all these economic promises, all the tax cuts, all the spending pledges made by the other candidates, are going to be completely undone in an instant if we end up with no deal. And on the question of prorogation, prorogation, which is, for those of you who don't follow this ludicrous word, is basically what Charles I tried to do. You lock the doors of Parliament, right? Now, I had, a, I had a disagreement with the Attorney General today about this, and the Attorney General assures me it's not illegal to do it. Well, it may not be illegal, but I can assure you it is undemocratic, it is unconstitutional, and it is profoundly <laughs> offensive. So you spoke about the need to live within our means and also not to pledge vast amounts of money to departments before actually getting into government. So what would you do with the Ministry of Defence? It's got a huge budget black hole, increasing pressures when it comes to its spending needs. And you've listed your links to the military and your fondness of it. So mm. what would you do if you were Prime Minister? OK. I think the first thing is to understand that defence spending, and this is something I fought for very hard when I was chair of the Defence Select Committee, was to get defence spending up to 2% of GDP. And it was something that my father, this tartan swathed eccentric that I keep describing, felt that was the only thing I'd really helped to achieve in Parliament, helped with other people, was to get defence spending up. What we discovered when we got defence spending up to 2% of GDP is that that did not begin to cover the black hole in the department's finances. It cannot make sense, cannot make sense, I'm afraid, in the condition that we are currently in, to double defence spending from 2% to 4% of GDP. I cannot, cannot make sense. That is an extra £43 billion pounds a year. We simply don't have that kind of money. The only way of dealing with this issue is to try to look seriously at what the threats are, the real threats that face us in the future. And what are those threats? I don't feel these threats are primarily threats which are to do with aircraft carriers. Right? These are threats which are primarily to do with cybersecurity, asymmetric warfare, 
special operations and intelligence from Russia, and the kind of destabilization that we've seen in Syria. In other words, what we need to do, I believe, is focus on getting those finances order and getting a military that exists above all to fight the threats of the 21st century. And that will involve, I'm afraid, unless our economy grows enormously, making some very, very difficult and very tough decisions about what our priorities are. And I'm not going to solve the problems of the Ministry of Defense by promising 43 billion pounds extra that we don't have. News. Um, you've just, first of all, talked about potentially supporting a, a Labour initiative to block a no-deal. Won't that hugely anger some Tory MPs and Tory members, just the people who support you're trying to win right now? And you've also talked about trying to sort things out and take action. But really, how does your Brexit plan, I know you've talked about things like citizens' assemblies, but how does that really end up resolving this issue of Brexit and somehow getting a deal through as you want to? Okay. So... Let, let's, let's take the more fundamental question, which is uh, really the big, big elephant in the room. The big elephant in the room, represented by my famous friend who's standing in front of me, right. who, you, who you would have seen in, in various, uh, various films. Um, look, this is the big elephant in the room, and the reason why it's the elephant in the room is because of one big P, which is Parliament. In the end, we live in a parliamentary democracy. So we've had a direct democratic vote, which is instructed a parliament to leave the European Union, and our indirect democratic system, our representative democracy, has so far blocked it. So there is a standoff. And there is only one way of resolving this problem, which is through parliament, right? It's a very, very uncomfortable truth. The solution does not lie in Europe. There's not going to be some brand new, brand new negotiation with Europe. The solution doesn't lie in trying to prorogue parliament or shut the doors on it. The solution has to lie on getting it through Parliament. And I'm not going to tell you, or the people of Britain, that there is some magic answer to doing this, right? If there were a magic answer, we would have left six months ago. In the end, it comes down to maths. There are 270 MPs who voted for that. We would need to get another 45 MPs to vote for it. Why is it that I am slightly, and I say slightly, more hopeful that we could do it now than when the Prime Minister tried to do it? Firstly, we've had the results of these European elections, which will have actually had an electric effect on both Conservative and Labour MPs. Secondly, it's beginning to dawn on some people that the one reason we didn't actually leave the European Union in March is that it was blocked by people who claim to really support Brexit, right? The reason we haven't left, the reason we're in the European Union, is these people who claim to support Brexit have actually refused to vote for a moderate, pragmatic deal that could provide great opportunities for British industry, if we got it right. The third reason to be a little bit more optimistic is that despite my enormous admiration for the Prime Minister, and I think she did an incredible job, I'm not her. I would be coming in with a fresh mandate. That isn't actually particularly about the fact that I've been a professional diplomat, that I negotiate for a living, and that I think I found as chair of the Defence Select Committee I was able to get Labour voters to vote for me to get there. It's simply because I would come in with a fresh mandate. But if that doesn't work, if Parliament cannot be unlocked, we need to release the pressure from Parliament. We need to take the party politics out of Parliament. And that's where I believe we should be looking at the option of holding over Parliament the threat of a Brexit assembly. In other words, a grand jury of citizens who would sit for three weeks to go through these issues in detail and make recommendations back to Parliament. Because nobody can get round the fact that we're stuck we're gridlocked. Nothing is moving. And unless Parliament will move, we're never going to leave the European Union. And the fury that people feel at the moment, fury that the public feel, which is really not a fury, I don't believe, talking to Brexit voters in Peterborough, was not primarily about the shape of the deal the Prime Minister was offering. Their fury is about the fact that they felt they voted to leave, and it hasn't happened. And I think if I can deliver a moderate, pragmatic Brexit, which is close to the European Union, economically, diplomatically, politically, unleash the opportunities for the British car industry, unleash the opportunities for British agriculture, get the investment flowing into this country once again, then we will get over this issue. And then all these questions that you're asking about people who are voting for the Brexit Party will be resolved. The one way 
to deal with the Brexit party is to deliver a sensible Brexit. This whole mess started as an infight in the Conservative Party. It needs to end with the Conservative Party. Revoke Article 50 is the only real way forward. A second referendum will just divide the nation further. Right, OK. It will leave the vision yeah, for years. Okay. OK, thank you. I mean, this gentleman is a very famous gentleman, as, as many of you will have seen on the television. Just the messenger. Um, uh, and actually, it's very interesting hearing your views. I thought you were in favor of a second referendum. You're actually in favor of simply of revoking. Um, I think the problem with this, and I, I know there are people in this audience who are passionately in favor of remaining in the European Union. Right? I'm very, very proud to have the support of my friend Ken Clark, who, <laughs> and in. Indeed, had I managed to persuade him to stand, I would probably be backing him for the leadership and he'd be standing on <laughs> second. Um, however, however, I do not think that anything in this country ultimately can be resolved by simply lurching to one extreme or the other. I actually, my entire political project, the only reason to vote for me, and I know this is literally the most unpopular thing to say in British politics at the moment, is to compromise. I've actually been told this by a pollster, Sir John Curtis, the most distinguished pollster of his generation, Stirling University, told me that I'm completely out of my mind. He said that if I'd been standing on a ticket of moderation and compromise 20 years ago, I would have been fine because public opinion was a bell shape. Everybody was in the middle. Now, he says, public opinion is a U shape. Right? There's nobody in the middle. Everybody's on the extremes. Nobody wants to compromise. And all my friends who voted Remain say, I'm not compromising with anybody. Why should I compromise the Brexiteers? And the Brexiteers are saying, I'm not concentrating with the Remainers. We won. And everybody's claiming to speak for the people. There and everybody no claims to be right, OK? And there is no compromise. We're you see that? We're in or we're out. OK. It's the, black and white. OK. So you, you embody your view, absolutely. And, and I'll try to answer your view, OK? Thank you. I don't believe that anything can be resolved like that. I think that if we think like that, in 40 years' time, we will remain a deeply divided country. I think the only way to come through this is to find a moderate, pragmatic Brexit that accepts 52% of people voted Brexit, 48% voted Remain, and therefore, and it doesn't matter how many referendums you do, yeah, the, the result might swap from side to side, but we'd still be split absolutely 50-50 straight down the middle in this country. Young against old, Scotland against England, the North against London. These are not divisions that we want to, that we want to perpetuate. OK, fine. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, very good. OK, thank you, sir. I promised you two questions. I, you've had two questions. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you again. Great. OK. Mr. Stewart, you talked about the energy of shame. I wonder, do you feel a sense of shame when you look upon the terrible conditions in the migrant detention centers in Libya? And do you feel a sense of shame when you receive reports in your department of the hundreds and hundreds of migrants who are still drowning in the Mediterranean? Yeah. Well, I think anybody who's seen those camps, and I've been to Libya, and you presumably have been to Libya, um, and I, I also visited the displaced people in the hockey stadium in Athens, and I saw Afghans crammed, maybe three, 4,000 people in what used to be the airport terminal in Athens, and I've seen the refugees in Jordan, and in Turkey, and in Iraq, cannot help but feel that. And I think we need to respond to that. But we have to respond sensibly and equitably. Right? We have an equal obligation, I feel, morally, to every human being on this earth. Not just the people who were lucky enough to make it to Greece, but also to the people who we're looking after in Jordan. Right? There are a million refugees in Jordan. There are 1.2 million in Lebanon. There are nearly 2 million in Turkey. And I'm also aware that many of those young men that I spoke to in Greece, and I speak Dari, so I was able to communicate with them, came from wealthy middle class families in Kabul. They paid 3,000 euros to get there. And they felt an incredible sense of personal pressure from their families. They felt that they'd failed because they hadn't made it to Germany. They felt they failed because they hadn't made it to Britain. It was incredibly psychologically destructive for them. So we have to find some way of trying to balance these things. So Yes, I feel deep shame. But at the same time, I'm not sure that there is some easy solution to this. And I think we have to treat people equally, and we have to work out 
ultimately what we can do in Afghanistan or in Libya to try to make sure that people can live decent, humane, and prosperous lives there. Hello, Michael Settle from The Herald. Um, one of the issues that hasn't been uh, emphasized very much during this uh, brief leadership contest is the Constitution and the threat that the Brexit pose, process poses for the Constitution. I was just trying to get a sense of how fearful you are that the UK could break up on the back of it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I begin, I began with unity, I ended with unity. I, I talked about the fact that I am part Irish, part Scottish, part English, representing a border constituency, and I'm terrified uh, about the way in which we keep this miracle called the United Kingdom together. Right? The biggest political campaign in my life before I started doing this was the Scottish referendum campaign. Some of you, I can see in this room, stood with me on the English-Scottish border at Gretna building a huge pile of cans. We ended up with 120,000 stones marked with messages from people bringing them across the United Kingdom to try to keep this country together. And Brexit imposes real, real strains, particularly no-deal Brexit. Right? No-deal Brexit, at the way it's presented at the moment, I'm afraid by Boris, in this latest interview in the Sunday Times, says not only that he's not giving the 39 billion, but he's also challenging Europe about the issue of the Irish border. Right? That border is absolutely fundamental to the way in which we think about the Good Friday Agreement. There are different views right, from the two different communities in Ireland about what exactly that border means to them. But there's nobody doubts that this border matters and the way that you deal with that border matters. Again, a no-deal Brexit is giving an extraordinary gift to Nicola Sturgeon. Just as I'm afraid, and this is one of the other reasons I'm against the second referendum, I'm worried that a second referendum is also giving a huge gift to people who are going to try to rerun the independence referendum in Scotland. So this whole thing is shaking this very precious entity. Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, England, we've kept them together for hundreds of years. It's the reason for our success in the world. OK, five minutes more, and then I'm going to let you all go, because I've been banging on too much. Here we are. Uh, sir, first, yeah. So, um, I'm a um, transgender and ethnic minority person in the UK. And um, for the last couple of years, um, from before I started my journey to where we are now, there's been a large rise in the negativ negativism you described. And I think you were really eloquently put where the public opinion went from a bell shape to a sort of U-shape. And I really feel that now, and it's become tangible in exchanges on the street. It's become tangible in exchanges in places where I've never felt it before. How do you plan to rectify that issue? Well, firstly, by embracing you, by welcoming you, to say how moved I am that you've come, how moved I am that you've spoken how much in our society we should cherish each other, how much we should respect each other's identity, to display in everything that we do our pride in each other, my pride in you, uh, and my sense of pride that you've come to hear me. Uh, and this is about, it's about listening, and I'm afraid it's about love. So I'm going to take one, two, three, and I think that'll probably be one, two, three, four. OK, and that'll be done. Then. Every single government department says the same thing about every single type of Brexit possible. Why won't you support a second referendum or just stopping Brexit altogether? Very good. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next question. Yep. Uh, th this gentleman here, sorry, and then we're going to go over that. Yep. Yep. Um, winning the Tory race, delivering Brexit, that's all well and good, but... Surely the big woolly mammoth in the room is what makes you believe you're the candidate who can defeat Jeremy Corbyn and a resurgent left in a general election. I mean, surely that's the biggest threat. I mean, call me Bach because I'm Jewish, but I think that's the biggest threat we're facing in this country. So what makes you think you're the person to sure. deliver on that? Sure. 
Okay, very good. Uh, sir? Thank you. Um, I have a question about the Conservative Party itself and um, to what Dominic Reeve referred to recently as entryism. And I saw the terrible clip of the meeting in Beaconsfield when he was shouted down by apparently members of the Conservative Party for stating very clearly and very logically the consequences of leaving the customs union. And that worries me deeply, and I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that, please. Okay. Right, let's try to take then these two challenges and then wrap up so that you can go on and, and enjoy your evenings. Okay, so we've got two types of challenge. We've got the Brexit challenge again, questions about second referendums, customs union, and then we've got the question that's come on what makes me think that I can defeat Jeremy Corbyn and the resurgent left. So let's deal with them both, and then I'll wrap up and let you go. And it goes like this. Right? My project in the end is fundamentally just about one thing. It's about moderation. It's about compromise. I, I talked about it in relation to my father, about that golden mean between cowardice and foolhardiness. I talked about it in relation to this gentleman about trying to find the golden mean between an extreme Remain position and an extreme Brexit position. I talk about it in the golden mean about trying to hold the United Kingdom together, but it's always the same theme. Right? The same theme is that in the end, we have much, much more in common than divides us, that we have to live together, that we know that we're split as a country 50-50 on all these different issues, but actually, we also know if we sit in a room, if we listen to each other, if we challenge each other, if we begin to think, we actually find out that we have much more respect for each other, much more admiration for each other, much more capacity to compromise with each other than we could ever imagine. That this country has never been so educated, it's never been so healthy. That in all these places that I've been talking to people, what comes to me again and again is the energy of the British people, the smartness, the, the imagination, the, the challenges that I get on disability, the challenges that I get on seven people living in a two-bedroom house in Lewisham, the lady that comes up to me embarking to say, this is not a place where I want my children to live, but this is how I could make it into a place where my children could live. In the end, we're bound together. We're bound together because we experience together. We experience together the same frustrations. Together, we care about the fact that there is too much mental illness in this country. Together, we care about the fact that we want to feel safe in our streets. Together, we deeply, deeply ought to care about adult social care, the great unresolved challenge of our generation, the inability to really come together across political lines to solve it. What is that about? That's about the golden mean. That's about green papers, white papers, royal commissions, people fantasizing about solving social care, and nobody actually ever sitting down cross-party together to deal with it, so that at the moment, in my constituency and in constituencies up and down this country, you currently get only 15 minutes from a carer, not long enough to change you or wash you or have a conversation before they're out of the door again, because there is not enough resources in the system, and we haven't solved this problem. Which brings me to, how do I defeat Jeremy Corbyn? I would hope, I would hope that people would vote for me against Jeremy Corbyn in the same way that I would hope that they would vote for the other version of Jeremy Corbyn, which is the fairy stories of the no Brexit right. Because we are in a competition of fairy stories. In the end, in the politics of the United States, and the politics of Europe, we are again and again coming back to the same thing the fairy stories, and we are realists. Right? What makes me a conservative, what makes me proud to be British, is that I have my feet on the ground. I don't just walk because I like the fresh air. I walk because I like my feet on the ground. You are a nation of people who keep their feet on the ground. You are a nation of people who believe in your hearts that this country can be fairer, can be greener, can be more united. Because like me, you understand that the only wisdom is the wisdom of humility. Humility is endless. Thank you very much indeed.